Hello, everyone. I'm Eric Kekula, a professor at the USC Price School of Public Policy at the University of Southern California. And this is one of a series of short presentations I'm giving on my book, China from a US Policy Perspective. Today, we're going to look at China from a US Homeland Security Perspective. And for this purposes, uh, these purposes, I'm going to look at this diagram, which gives an overview both of the presentation and um, a conceptual framework as well for thinking about how the different elements of homeland security policy uh, fit together. As you can see, what we have here is a continuum of policy issues uh, in the context of homeland security beginning with food and drug safety, then moving on to communicable diseases, including COVID, um, moving then to bioterrorism, cyber attacks, and critical infrastructure. And these are linked together uh, in a particular way as, as we shall see. What holds all of them together is uh, this notion of the invasiveness of some malign uh, phenomena, uh, some danger to the US public um, that represents a kind of an external threat that is other than outright military, which would bring us into the topic of defense, which is uh, what we'll talk about in the next presentation. But there are a whole range of topics, such as the ones we're looking at here, uh, that fall short of outright military hostility or dangers, but still all have in common this notion of invasiveness across the border, uh, including with uh, food and drug safety. Now, food and drug safety is actually doubly invasive in the sense that if we're looking at food products uh, or drug pharmaceutical products, that are imported from abroad. They are sort of invasive in that sense of being imported across the national boundary line. But they are also invasive in the sense that we are actually ingesting them. The public, the US public is ingesting food that may be imported, food products that may be imported from abroad or pharmaceutical products that are may be imported from abroad. And so there's actually an invasiveness of our very bodies through this. So what we see happening over the last decade or more, as is the case with all kinds of products, uh, they are subject to global supply chains. But when we're looking at global supply chains for food products, uh, this poses uh, additional challenge and costs in in thinking about how uh, we ensure uh, the safety and quality and safety of the products that are being brought in, the food and pharmaceutical products brought in. And you can see from this graphic, there are a whole host of concerns and complications arising. Uh, it's tricky enough to try to ensure food and drugs safety if all of all of the production takes place within the United States. If the production is far flung, including in China, which is increasingly the case that we are importing, uh, have been importing uh, additional food and pharmaceutical products, then <clears throat> these challenges arise. Generally, there are two approaches to doing this kind of uh, uh, homeland security policy and implementation of that. One is through an outcome-based approach, which is essentially making sure that the end product itself is safe. And the other is a production-based approach, which is ensuring that if all of the elements of production are being done right, then the final product should be done right. Neither of those approaches is fail-proof, so some combination of the two is likely warranted. Now, if we add 
to this general problem of food and drug safety, or the challenge of food and drug safety, um, we, if we add the element of infectiousness, then that brings us into the realm of communicable diseases, including COVID, of course. Now, this infectiousness is, again, the key ingredient that, that separates us from the topic that we just addressed. Uh, because if I contract food poisoning from consuming some product that was um, not safe, um, it's unlikely that I'm going to give that to you. It is not infectious. If you consume the same product, you might also get um, fall ill, but that's not a question of infectiousness. But with the case of um, SARS back in 2003, 2004, in the case of uh, H1N1, the, uh, and now in the case of COVID, we see that when we add an element of infectiousness, it complicates the situation all that much more. And unfortunately, uh, this topic has, arri has arisen with um, new force uh, with the uh, arrival of this COVID-19 virus, which began in China and then quickly spread throughout the rest of the world, including the United States, and has engulfed us, engulfed us all. Um, so most of us are living this experience as I, as I speak. Uh, so in that sense, we don't need to say too much about it. We can look around and see the nature of the challenge. But I think the, the key point is that like the issue of climate change and some other topics, there are certain um, situations where what we're looking at is essentially a global public good. In the case of climate change, the global public good is one of, um, of a benign climate and of a sustainability of the planet. Um, in the case of pandemics, the, the global good is public health, increased public health. And the nature of this global public good of public health is such that because it's global in nature, whether we like it or not, we're, we're a society that is connected not just through trade and through communications, we are connected to the world biologically. We are biological creatures. Uh, we come into contact with one another. It's, it is a globalized world. And as the spread of COVID-19 uh, demonstrates all too well, a, an epidemic that begins anywhere in the world, whether it's China or Africa, as in the case of the Ebola virus, or whether it might arise here in the United States or any place else, an epidemic that begins anywhere um, can quickly spread and become a pandemic everywhere. And unfortunately, we are we are uh, experiencing that now. And from a public policy perspective, there are two elements that we want to focus on. One is preventing the outbreak in the first place. Uh, and again, because it's in our, our own interest in the United States, even narrowly construed, even if we didn't care at all about anybody else, but of course we do, even if that were the case, it would still be in our interest to work with other countries to ensure that these kinds of outbreaks are not going to happen anywhere because if they do, they have the potential all too readily of finding their way into the United States. We're not hermetically sealed from the rest of the world. But in addition to that, so cooperation to pre preventing the outbreak in the first place. And then once there is an outbreak, 
cooperation in terms of uh, addressing the disease and looking to eradicate it because again, it, we're all connected and having one part of the world, having one country um, pull itself into, into uh, relatively good shape with respect to protection from the virus, um, they still may be exposed by others. So, so, the, so the imperative for global cooperation, whether it's through WHO or other mechanisms for ensuring cooperation couldn't be more clear, more compelling than in the case of global pandemics. Now, returning to our schematic, um, if we add to these communicable, dis communicable diseases, where we've already added infectiousness, if we add the additional element of intentionality, then these kinds of viral pandemics could take on the hue of bioterrorism, uh, where it is the specific intent of, of hostile agents, whether they be nation states or fringe terrorist groups, what have you, there is unfortunately a, a danger in principle uh, of some hostile agent uh, gaining access to very dangerous biological elements and releasing them to the public. Now, in the case of China, there's no reason for us, certainly that I'm aware of, to think that China is a specific threat in terms of bioterrorism. We do see examples of bioterrorism of, of even nation states um, using uh, chemical agents and other, um, other um, elements to that are in effect a kind of bioterrorism against their own populations or, or others. And that's something that as part of a homeland security mandate, uh, we must look at as a country to think about how to protect ourselves. We can see from COVID how huge a challenge it is, even in with the lack of overt hostility and intent behind COVID, it's still a huge challenge for us. But if, if it were being propagated intentionally, willfully um, from whatever source, that makes it all the, all the more dangerous and frightening to contemplate. If we add to that um, the cybersphere, then we're moving from biological viruses to one of digital or cyber viruses. And that, when combined with intentionality and infectiousness, um, essentially brings us into cyber attacks. And as this quote, uh, this is from a book by Richard Clark and Robert Knecki, um, this quote indicates cyber war is real. Cyber war happens at the speed of light. Cyber war is global. Cyber war skips the battlefield and cyber war has begun. And keep in mind that that book, their book was written 10 years ago. So if this was all true 10 years ago, it's perforce more true today. And in this context, China is not the only player, but it certainly is a player. Uh, as we've seen, Russia, uh, Iran are potentially hostile, potentially or actually hostile forces that are engaged in cyber warfare against the United States, uh, China as well. And of course, the US and many of its allies are also engaged uh, in, 
these same cyber activities. So uh, this is a realm of the public good that is increasingly being impacted and it affects all of us because all of us are connected, including this very lecture is all happening through uh, being delivered through the cyber realm. And it's um, particularly poignant in the case of China uh, for a couple of reasons. One is of course that China is uh, the evidence clearly indicates that uh, forces within China, agents within China, uh, quite likely with the uh, active backing um, of the, uh, the security apparatus in China itself. Uh, but there are many um, cyber attacks, cyber intrusions into uh, the US domain, uh, often looking to acquire uh, important information, strategic information, whether it's uh, economic, uh, has economic value or military or defense value or other kinds of strategic value. And the other reason that China is particular per particularly pertinent in this regard is that the separation between private information, privately owned data, and what is um, government and the public security data, that separation is uh, much, much less in force uh, than even here in the US. And we do have many issues around, around this here in the US, but at least in the US, there is a, uh, a presumption prima facie that uh, privately held data are not uh, subject to governmental uh, oversight and cannot just be taken um, willfully by the government. Whereas in China, the Chinese national cybersecurity law of 2016 uh, actually makes it clear that any company in China that has uh, data that the private that the state security apparatus deems to be of strategic uh, national security importance, any such private company in China must uh, provide that data um, if, if compelled to do so. And so that's an additional reason uh, for those of us in the US to be concerned about uh, the potential for data, private data from the US, whether it's of economic value, strategic value, personally, or in other ways, uh, to be accessed directly by Chinese public security forces. And this is even more so in the context now of the internet of things and of 5G, uh, 5G, um, the fifth generation of internet technology, which is the uh, backbone for the internet of things where all devices that we use, not just things that we think of as being computers, but refrigerators, parking meters, elevators, uh, traffic lights, any apparatus at all that's, that has a digital element uh, is becoming linked uh, through this 5G technology to the internet of things. And so we're becoming increasingly integrated as a society in terms of our functionality through uh, through our cyber connections. They're as, they're, they're as vital, becoming almost as vital as our biological connections uh, to others in our society. And so we see that, uh, for example, in the context of smart cities where health data, uh, data uh, that help to 
run smart buildings that do the climate control of buildings that operate our transportation systems, our air traffic control, uh, meteorological devices, uh, healthcare technologies, all of these things uh, are becoming increasingly integrated. And if 5G technology is the backbone for this, and if Huawei is uh, really the single company in the world that is best positioned in terms of its techno technology and its size and its wherewithal to be producing and providing and building this 5G technology, uh, it raises concerns about the potential vulnerability and that poses public policy issues for the US in terms of thinking about where to draw the line, uh, how, to what extent uh, should we allow Huawei to participate in this because they clearly do have skill set and to offer in terms of building this technology, which has many potential benefits, but at the same time safeguarding against the downside, potential downside uh, from this. The rise of China and the case of Huawei in particular make these issues particularly poignant, but these are issues that would exist even without China. The whole question of um, data, private data person and privacy concerns and who owns data and with and what data can be shared with whom under what conditions. I think Europe is ahead of the United States in terms of framing that in a fairly comprehensive way. It should be a high priority uh, public policy uh, concern for the United States as well, made all the more so uh, given these Chinese uh, connections. And finally, the cybersecurity and the cyber infrastructure is a core and a very critical uh, element of US infrastructure overall. But in uh, recent years, uh, the United States government, uh, especially through the National Infrastructure Protection Plan, uh, has identified uh, more than a dozen specific sectors that are deemed to be critical infrastructure, it includes food and agriculture, dams, critical manufacturing, communications technologies, commercial facilities, water facilities, financial services, public health facilities, transportation facilities, government governance facilities. All of these uh, have critical infrastructure, some of which is rooted in cyber, in the cybersphere, others which are rooted in more traditional physical and other um, institutional elements, but all of which have potential vulnerabilities. And working out a strategy uh, for, of preparedness in the case that any of these sectors or multiple sectors, because they tend to be interlinked, uh, we making sure that they are resilient and uh, not uh, overly vulnerable to attack, especially through hostile elements that are, that are specifically setting out to do damage. Uh, this is a huge challenge for the United States. The case of COVID and the way it's unfolded here is really uh, demonstrates, this may be one positive side to what has been a terrible experience with COVID. One positive side may be that it is a wake up call for what we need to do in the United States in terms of preparing ourselves across the board uh, for all of these elements and making sure that they're resilient to the kinds of threats uh, that uh, really manifest themselves across all elements of this spectrum, but in more uh, dangerous ways as we progress uh, through these elements of infectiousness, intentionality, cybersphere, and other realms. So that's a quick view of China from a US homeland security perspective. Thank you for joining me.
See you next time.